Hello, Gary. Hello, Guy. One of my favourite albums growing up was Performance Rockin' the Fillmore, which was Humble Pie's double live album. And Martin and I just played the death, played it to death. Uh, Do you know what, Gary? Yeah. Our listeners, a lot of them, are going to know that because you have actually referenced it a right. few times. Well, I have. And also because we, 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 we had Peter Frampton on, right? Who plays on That's that. right. That's right. He was the first one. And you, you love doing that line from it. It's been a gas, whatever. Yes, we go home on Monday, but I want to tell you, it's really been a gas this time. <laughs> and I've got to say, I went back and listened to it a couple of days ago. It is magnificent. It really is. I mean, that's it really so, some of the some the swing that that band had as well. Yeah, and and some of the extended stuff like Walk on Gilded Splinters, taking up a whole of one side. I mean, such it's technically brilliant. But yeah. at the same time, you know, full of gusto and, you know, takes you back to what it must have been like in that in that New York venue back in uh, 1972 or whenever it was. Um, <clears throat> so we've got Jerry Shirley on, who is one of the few surviving members of Humble Pie and played with yeah. Humble Pie all the way through. But he also played he, in... It, well, he also played... He did all sorts of things. Um he was in Waystar with Pete Way and Fast Eddie from uh, Motorhead. Of course, famously, was on Sid Barrett's last two albums. He, or only two albums, I think, wasn't it? I mean, just... Oh, yeah, 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 so yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. And played... It was only complicated. But, and where he started, though, is fantastic. We don't want to give too much away. No, but, it, but he also... He, he played at one of the only live Sid Barrett shows... Olympia. That's right. Where well, it's where you say, which I want to know because it was the it was it says the Olympia. I mean, is that Olympia? Yeah, because the that's Olympia. huge. No, but it wasn't just it was it was a night of festivities. Um, it was one of those kind of hangs, and I think it was <clears throat> it was called something like the Extravagant Fashion Festival. I mean, we'll we'll ask Jerry. Um, yeah. And lots of bands played. I mean, you know, it, you know, obviously Coliseum because they played at all those things. <laughs> 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 but but uh, yeah, and I think you know status quo played there and uh, Black Sabbath and um, you know it was a tune in turn on drop out sort of evening yes. day. Well, which is very much what Sid did, isn't it? Because he he walked off halfway through the fourth number. That's right. Anyway, I think Jerry's got tons of stories about. He has. He's uh, yeah. I, I've I've met Jerry in the past, and he's a he's a lovely fella. So we're going to do Sid, and we're going to do humble pie. Let's get him yeah, on. Yeah, and, and ah. the apostolic, uh, uh, apostolic convention. That's easy for you to say. Is that a saint? <laughs> an apostle? Well, it's apostles, isn't it? In, to do with apostles. An intervention. This what we exactly what we need right now, right? Because <laughs> we can't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Sir. Let's get him on. Welcome to the Rock on Tours. Okay, guys, I'm ready. But it's a big tune for sure. I actually wrote that originally for Tina Turner. Of course, I had gone and found Joni Mitchell down in Florida and brought her back. I've listened to a few of them and they've been really good, man. I've been sitting in the back of the car coming into London. They're brilliant. That caused a big problem in the band, actually. I was having too much fun. Thank you guys for still being around, still making music, still being into it, and doing this podcast. It, it's uh, it's fabulous. Well, I get the feeling that us three should go for a pint. That's what I think. I'm in a band now. <laughs> it's called Roxy Music. You know this thing about the 10,000 hours of experience? Oh, yeah, it's it's Get good at something. When we recorded Arnold Lane, we'd done about 50 hours. The Rock Hunters Podcast with Gary Kemp and Guy Pratt. Keep on rocking! <laughs> hey! Uh, Hallelujah! Hello, mate. Oh, I have Thanks. to be honest with you because I, I did a little bit of research. I knew you guys were North Londoners, or G Gary anyway, but this is where I'm from. <laughs> oh, no. He holds oh, up a spurs. Oh, so, uh, but that, uh, I guess we'll get beyond that because we both had a bit of a kick up this season, wouldn't you say? Well, we're in Champions League, Jerry. Yeah, you are in the Champions League for the first time in a little while. <laughs> oh, it's going to get bitter and twisted. Oh, <laughs> so, but, uh, thanks for do thanks for doing this. Yeah. Oh yeah, man, this is great. I'm, I'm I'm just I was shocked and amazed that you asked me. Really, to be honest. No, oh, well, you shouldn't be, uh, Jerry. I was looking for you at the Sid Barrett. Yeah. movie screening uh, i couldn't see you. i was there um I, I saw a bunch of people i hadn't seen in literally 50 years almost and um i got there late anyway but the person that 
I was there, I was there with my ex and um, John Hamill, our old roadie, um, who went on to work with McCartney for 45 years. And he's just recently retired from working with Paul. And uh, he's one of my dearest old mates. So he and his wife and me and my ex were there together. I was in, the, you know, they had it in three theatres. Yeah, so, yeah. We were in the second, not the not the main one. There was one off to the whatever that was, you know. The, the... Right, right. What, what, what do you, what, so I haven't seen the Sid Barrett doc. It's coming out soon, I know. Um, what, what did you, you guys think of it? Guy, what did you think? Uh, I thought it was great. What? Yeah. We, oh, so no, Jerry should go. No, first. no, you you go first because I'd, I'd be I I'd, I'd got a story to tell you about what happened with me. But anyway, go ahead. You what did you think? No. All right. Uh, I thought it was great. I thought it was really really good, and I loved hearing storms interjections yeah. from behind the camera. But then that's what made it slightly weird was seeing everyone interviewed like ten fifteen years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Just, so, it's, so it's like a new film with a sort of new perspective, mm -hmm. but everyone's a bit younger. <laughs> long <laughs> long in the making. Well, and Storm yeah. has died since yeah, then. Well, but some of us yeah. were, were, some of us weren't. I mean, it, it, he he started it, as you probably know, but then he got sick and sadly passed away. Yeah. But what, one of his dying wishes were that they continue, they finished it and they finished it in the manner that he started it. They came to interview me. And I had just had my hips replaced not long before. So I was still recovering from that. And I had before that done an interview many years before for the BBC about Sid. And I'd forgotten that they'd come down to interview me down here in Cornwall, mainly because I'd literally, I'd just come out of hospital weeks before and I was kind of still, you know, um, Still learning to walk, really. Uh, anyway, I kind of, it started to come back to me that yes, I remembered them being here and and that, but I didn't remember much. I said, "How long did we um, did I talk for?" You know, and they said, "Oh, we've got about an hour and a half." Really? I said, "Well, you're not going to use all of it." I said, "No, no, no." I said, "Well, how much are you going to use?" Said, oh, about thirty seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay, that's great. You know, that same applied to everybody, really. But as it got closer to the bit where you could, I knew it, my bit had be coming up because it, as it went chronologically, my ex, bless her, she starts to doze off a little bit. So I turned as, and my picture came up on the screen, and I turned to kind of go, wake up, dear. <laughs> Look back, and I was gone. Oh, that was it. <laughs> Missed it. Oh, and then you were gone. Oh, apparently, I mentioned Willie Wilson, bless him, and and, and that was it. I don't, I don't, I didn't get, I didn't actually see, or if I, you know, I only saw a tiny bit of, of the small bit that was in there, which was fine. I mean, I didn't go there to yeah. see my bit. I went there to see the whole thing. And I, thought, yes, you did. We all do. Yeah, we all do. Yeah, and I, I thought it was brilliantly done. <laughs> I thought it portrayed Sid the way he should have been portrayed, as a lovely man that he actually was. I didn't know him before the fire, if you like. You know, I knew him after the fire, and uh, that's a very that's a sweet way of putting it. Well, it's you know, it's it, it, it's it's a fact, and, and and so I would get hmm. glimpses of the, the old Sid, um, except they would happen in strange ways. As an example, he would. He was my going to the speakeasy buddy, except Sid's way of going to the speakeasy, all dressed to kill, you know, looking cool, looking because Sid still looked cool then, you know, the, um, in mm -hmm. 1971, um, except his eyes had gotten to that sort of dark, you know, the, 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 what's the line from the song, the dark holes, holes in the whatever. But he still, you know, was dressed. Good, he, and he and he was Sid Barrett, you know, he had presence. So he'd turn up at me and Willie's flat on Redcliffe Gardens, ready to go to the speakeasy, except it was eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> oh, okay, Sid, well, uh, come in. What, what time did it open? <laughs> uh, 11 o'clock. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't start to speak, didn't start getting going until 
11 and went until, I don't know, 2, 3 o'clock, 4 sometimes, I think. But, so he'd lost track of time completely. At that well, point. yeah, I mean, it, but and, and so we would say, well, OK, come on in, you know, and then we would do what, you know, 1970 hippies would do. We'd sit around all day, you know, rolling joints, smoking tea, listening to music, and he'd be perfectly normal. Uh, he never had any money on him, ever. Never, you know, so we'd drive him to the speakeasy and... I think because he either because he was with us or because I'd started to become known at that point a little bit, I'm not sure, we were let in for nothing, so we didn't have to worry about paying him to get in. But once we were in there, we bought, bought him his drinks and things. But the, the main thing was that he would be perfectly normal going there. But as soon as he went in, and bearing in mind it was his idea to go, he just shut off. As soon as he walked in, as soon as he was faced wow. with... People with the business, you know, with the place he wanted to go to. That was it. He was just shut down. He was just just staring into the middle distance and you couldn't get a word out of him until such time as it was time to go. And we'd drive him home and then 8 o'clock the next morning. (laughs) 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 Who was in the speakeasy when you were there? What, What sort of celebrities were around? Everybody, just about. It was divided into... Three areas. There was the restaurant. As you walked into the place, there was the bar and places to sit, bar to left, places to sit and stand right in front of you. Then directly in front of you, there was the restaurant that was had glass windows but was closed off from the rest of the club. Then you walked around the corner and there was the main music part where the the live music was played on a stage at the end of that that piece of the uh, and then at the far end back near the the entrance was the other part of the bar my best experience there that kept my feet firmly on the ground was with ginger baker years before when i was i think I must have been about 15 at the time. I we I was doing sessions for um, immediate records, uh, or for for Steve Marriott. I'd had a lot of compliments while I was doing these sessions by Steve. He used to show me off to all these big shot friends of his. Right, I'd be doing a drum check. You're a few years younger than everyone. Yeah, I, I, at well, this point, I, I'm, I'm talking about 66, yeah. 67. I was 14, 15, and um. And and and, and, I mean, what? and everybody that Steve's showing me off to, the people like Mick Jagger and Charlie Watts and Jimi Hendrix were all in their twenties already, late twenties, some maybe. Mm-hmm. But um, they were all very very sweet to me, you know. And I was very shy. I'd, he'd do the same thing every time. I'd be doing a drum check with Vin Johns or um, Eddie Kramer doing the sound. I'd have my head down, and, and of course, they were getting great drum sounds, it, but I was in Studio B. Anyway, so I'd have my head down and bang, glass wallop, you know, and then they'd say, right, come listen, and I'd look up, and there'd be Steve Marriott, Mick Jagger, and Charlie Watts. One, That was a one time, and I just wanted the ground to swallow me up. I was so, yeah, I mean, 14, and there's your heroes, and I'm in <laughs> that. And I was, I'm not very tall now, but I was a lot shorter then. So anyway, I get off the drum kit and I walk towards him and Charlie came over to me, put his arm around me and he said, oh, that's enough to make me want to cut my wrists off. And now wow. he, he didn't have to say something like that. And it's not true because he was just by far and away the greatest uh, groove drummer. I mean, Charlie's backbeat was just, and his snare drum sound was the best in the business. Always was, always will be. You know, may he rest in peace. And when Hendrix was the one, what he did was a similar thing. He's because they could see I was just shy and, and and nervous and stuff. And Hendrix said, "Well, man, he said that's really cool. That's really cool." So um, I go that's to the speaking. That's enough from Jimmy. And <laughs> the little band I was in at the time were playing, and we hadn't played very well. And I'm looking out at the bar, and there's Ginger Baker. So I thought, ah, okie dokie. Now, I get off the stage, and you had to walk past to get to the dressing room. You had to walk past where he was, 
to get there. So I'm walking along, trying to keep my head up, and as I get level with him, he's leaning very Ginger Baker-like against the bar, and as I walk past him, he looks at me and says, just, you know, just when my head's getting, you know, a little bit sort of, oh, I'm doing good here, and he looks straight at me and says, fucking shit. <laughs> <laughs> God. So oh, I thank him, may he rest in peace, for keeping my feet firmly on the ground. <laughs> wow, wow. You said, I wasn't that tall then, and I'm a bit taller now. So you're not even grown up. Yeah, what, what, now or then? <laughs> no, then. I mean, yeah, then you're still like a child growing up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I was still going. A massive Small Faces fan, weren't you, Jerry? Yeah. Did you have an incident where you 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 were bumped into Steve Marriott early on? Yeah, that's how it all started. It all started by seeing them on Ready Steady Go, and I was couldn't believe watching Kenny. It was like watching me. You know, he had the same drum kit. I just managed to save up enough money for a deposit on a silver glitter super classic Ludwig kit, which was what he had. And I, I, I didn't know he had. I didn't never seen them before. Mm. But, and, and he's playing style was exactly like mine and of course because they were the sort of king mods we suddenly became even more moddy than we were already becoming and we became like most bands did at the time which was the, a, a small faces copy band your name your name very much alluded to that didn't it yeah, well, yeah. At one point, yeah. We, we, when you mean when we were the little people, the li the little yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that you can't get any more alluding to being a small faces copy band. <laughs> right, right, um, right, right, right. Anyway, we played a gig supporting them, and my dad was helping the guy promote the show. I think, and uh, he went into their dressing room and and very politely, my, my dad was just. The greatest, he, you know, it was him that got me started. But anyway, he went in and inter introduced himself and just said, "Would you mind having a look at my son, who's playing in the band for you? Because he's a huge fan of yours, and it would mean a lot to me and be a lot to him." And so I don't know this is going on, and I'm on stage playing, and we're doing all the Tamala Motown hits. We had to take our small faces jackets off. You know, we couldn't, we couldn't. Support them and be looking like them, something. I turn to the left and I look in the wings, and there's Kenny Jones going like this. Thumbs oh. up. Oh. Now, wow. Now, at this point, I'm still, I was barely, I was just turned 14, I think. Then, minutes later, I look again, and there's him and Steve Marriott both going uh, like this. So, after the show, they came up to me and said, Ah, oh, that was fantastic. You were really doing great and jokingly. Well, I didn't know, you know, I went away thinking it might one day happen, but jokingly said, if Kenny ever gets sick, you could be standing. And I went, oh, wow, you know. So I'm getting all this tapping on the back. And again, I thank Ginger Baper for keeping me <laughs> on the ground. But that's how we first met him. Then... We met Steve in a, in a, in a, on Shaftesbury Avenue. He was in Drum City looking at something, and we were just looking in the shop window and saw him in there and just went in and re reintroduced ourselves. I think it was our keyboard player said to him, don't suppose you could record a single for us, could you? <laughs> you know, he was one of those guys, you know. Um, well, and I, I bet St Steve looked immaculate. I'm trying to picture this as well. Oh, Steve, yeah, yeah, Steve yeah. at this point... Is the best dressed guy in the world. And uh, he's just, in fact, I can remember literally what he was wearing that day. He had this fabulous, it was a typical kind of mod style jacket. And then he had a waistcoat that was made of the same material, but it was double breasted, kind of like a, a, a Western cowboy um, type of um, wow. waistcoat, for a white shirt, black mohair strides beautifully cut and a pair of white pumps you know um oh, sneakers. and he Whoa. he just not only did he look a million dollars you know his hair was just cool and he smelled like a million dollars you know because wow. they, they all 
were really into being immaculate in the, in the way that they dressed and and yeah. and um it, until the really until the 67ish when they turned into hippies that's when all that kind of went in they still dressed yeah. well but it wasn't quite as immaculate shall we say well yeah i always find that quite funny with all those people who were like such fantastic kind of dandies whatever and, and mods in the 60s where everything just became denim yeah, yeah, it did. It went, it, it went, you know. it went a, a bit. Well, I mean, you guys. Well, well, well hang on. They, they, have... but they went through their. Some of them went through their peacock era, didn't they? Yeah, the yeah. sort of you know King's Road look, and some of those either went denim like Marriott did, or glam like Bowie did. You know, yeah, there was yeah. definitely a or or or, or, or Mark Boland. So yeah. there was, you know, yeah, now, it, it, I'm it just was, seeing um, this. Or white boiler suit and boots, like Pete. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then, um, so, so good. So let's talk about how you ended up. You, because you, you, you were introduced to Angelou Golden, weren't you? At Immediate Records. Yeah, he was great. He was. Um, he again was immaculately dressed. Smelt like a million bucks, and um, and probably had a million bucks at the time. It's certainly... Well, no, he always said when we had we had him on here, and he was fantastic. Yeah. But he said about about money. He said, "Well, I was always I was either wearing it or drinking it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, or driving it, or being driven in it, or drive." Yeah, he had some fantastic cars. He was my first guy I ever knew to have one of those old single players that you could put having your car, so it played a single, you know, a forty five, um, vinyl. It, it, you know, any any forty five you like, you just slipped it wow. into this machine and it played it. But he had it so that the sound was like Phil Spector, big sound in the back of this um, Rolls Royce Phantom limousine. It was just fantastic. So yeah, he, he did either wear it or drink it. That's for sure. And but he changed he, he changed your yeah. name, and it was like what. Yeah, yeah, so he, he changed it to. We, we were going to be called the Nice, and Steve wanted us to be called the Nice, and um, Andrew said no and pinched it for at Arnold's band, which of course was um, Keith Emerson, uh, the Nice, Keith Emerson, <laughs> the Nice, yeah, Keith Emerson yeah. and uh, and the guys, yeah. um, I, and I, shame because it was a much nicer name. So Andrew comes up with, "You're going to be called the Apostolic Intervention." And we all went, oh, no. <laughs> okay. But it meant we got a single out. You know, did nothing. But it, no, great single. Great single. It's, it's, a, great, yeah. it's, a, mod, it's a mod yeah. classic, isn't it? It's a, it, it's a, yeah. And, and, and we, we started to get a little bit of a following, you know. And, and, and Steve wrote a single, didn't he? Have you ever seen me? It's, yeah, Steve, yeah, wrote Steve it. and Ronnie. I think it was actually might have more been more of a Ronnie song than a Steve because the night Ronnie Lane. Did, yeah Ronnie Lane because the, the night we did it Ronnie came along originally as one of as one of the two producers but he left in a bit of a huff I don't think he wanted us to do it for his own reasons but Steve bless his heart he stuck with it and we did the session did it at IBC got a great sound for the day and um, uh May he rest in peace, our then bass player, bold. He, he just couldn't hold his nerve together. So Steve jumps in and plays bass, and we get it in the first or second take. A couple of overdubs, put some timps on it, I think, and some uh, maybe a article, mixed it, and it was done. And then we had to do a B side that we, we did. We wrote, my brother and the keyboard player wrote, and it was an instrumental. It was like a Booker T um, ripoff, you know. And Steve also produced that. And you can hear him in the background um, singing the odd line and playing a bit of lead guitar too. He was so kind to us. He really was. He was great. Your life gets back with Steve later, but I think we'd I'd really like to know how it was recording with Sid Barrett because that was a produced. Am I right, Guy? Were they both produced by David Gilmore? No, the first one was David and Roger, and the second one was David with Rick That's helping right. out, wasn't it? Yep. What was it like playing with, with Sid on those 
Because you don't play on all the tracks. I think you play on two tracks on the first album, Madcap Laughs, yeah. and, and then you play on a lot more, don't you, on the second album. That's and right. Just give us a praises of what it, what the experience of being with Sid is like in the studio. Um, interesting, maddening, a nightmare, a privilege, all it same rolled into one ball. And were you friends of David's, or or did you did was it Sid who got you in? Yeah, uh, well, I was already I'd already met Dave David when um, he had just got the gig with Pink Floyd when I was working in Cambridge with Tim Rennick, the band that ah. Tim Rennick. Ah, they... So he came round to visit the, the band house we had in just in the outskirts of Cambridge, and two of the members of the band had worked. Uh, one of the members, the, the, the bass player Rick Wills, had worked with Dave. And um, we also, wild, and of course, Tim knew him from uh, growing up in Cambridge. And he actually came round one day, and I think, yeah, he ended up producing a demo for us, which nothing ever happened with. That's where I first got to know Dave. Then, within a year of him having the Floyd gig, I got Humble Pie gig. And then we both moved into the same area of London where Willie was already living, Willie Wilson, and all around the Redcliffe Gardens area. And uh, But did Sid come in with, with fully formed songs and yeah, did you all okay, play so, them together? Yeah, to, to answer, Gary, to answer you, uh, the, 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 um, about the experience of what it was like uh, uh, as a musician, was a drummer, you never knew which end it was going to be up. We had three ways of doing it. First was all, and this is quite a band if you think about it, playing as a four-piece, me on drums, Dave Gilmore on bass, Richard Wright on keyboards, Sid Barrett on lead guitar, and singing. Wow. <laughs> and we actually did a few of the songs live like that. The one in particular, and I think the only one that we got all the way through, is Gigolo Arms. Then the other way of doing it was Dave coming, David bringing Sid into the studio and having Sid record the song, whatever it was, like for instance, Baby Lemonade, with just him singing and playing guitar. And David would take it away and learn it up here. Um, because at the time, I don't know if he does now, but I don't believe he um read music at that at that. He learnt he learnt to read music so he could do saxophone lessons with his son. Right. But yeah. Not, but not, not for his music. Right. No. Exactly. And then that was years later. Back then, he yeah, was like right, all right. of us. Yeah, yeah. We were all ears music, all ears players. Um, mm. But anyway, so he would learn it, and they play it to me through the cans, and Dave would stand in front of me and conduct me because he's listening as well, and he knows it off by heart. So it's. Oh, baby, let me move up a bit, down a bit, over to the left a bit, you know, slow <laughs> down a bit, speed up a bit, you know. I mean, literally wow. conducting the tempo to me, we're anticipating where it's going to go. Um, and based, on, based, based on Sid's acoustic? Don't, yeah, so yeah. it's based on what Sid's already put wow. down on, 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 on a, wow. you know, a track. Because Domino's is you, isn't it? Yeah, Domino's is the best track on the on the album, and that was done. That's that's not me. That's the the, the best. Oh, that's not you. I thought that no, was. I, you. I yeah, wish sorry. because that's my favourite. Uh, that's Dave. That's David playing drums uh, again, overdubbed on what was uh, um, put together with Sid. You know, previously David was so patient with Sid. Through the whole thing, you know, it took sometimes hours to get one take out of him, whether it was all of us together or him on his own. On as an example, on the first album, uh, I seem to remember, and I'm not saying this as a put down or anything like that. Just uh, I remember Roger kind of having enough, sort of saying, I, "I just can't do this anymore," and David finishing it off and. Then very soon thereafter, the second album was to be made and Rich Rick Wright came in and took over and he hung in there through the whole thing. May he rest in peace.
I was listening to some of those albums today and the connection that I made in my mind was Noel Coward. There's yeah. something very Noel Coward about Sid's lyrics and his whimsy. I mean, especially something like an effervescing elephant or something. You know, you can imagine that as a coward song. Yeah, yeah. Well, or a Spike Milligan children's. Yeah, yeah. Spike Milligan absolutely. Was, you know, he yeah. had that yeah. very English side of his um, writing that few people have, that those two in particular we just mentioned. Um, it's interesting that you bring up Noel Coward because he's a hero of mine, but he was also a hero of Steve Marriott's. It was it was Steve that turned me on ah. to Noel Coward and all his books, you know, his some biographies and autobiographies and and bits of a hilariously funny man. Um, but uh, Gary's actually just reread his yeah. his biography. Yeah, I have. Yes, 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 yes. That's why he's at the front of his. Brain. Yeah, it is. I, I think we should get on to humble pie, don't you, guy? Go ahead. Yes, I, I mean, yeah. how did you? I mean, this is a. This was called a supergroup, wasn't it? I mean, that's that was because it was it was Peter Frampton from the Herd and Steve Marriott from the Small Faces, and at the beginning, Ian was going to play keyboards in the band, wasn't he? For five minutes. <laughs> uh, um, right, right. What happened McLean. was uh, Steve offered him a, a, a sort of a. Olive branch, I suppose, you know, hey, why don't you come down and, and rehearse with us and see if you like it? And we did one of his songs on the first album. Um, but there was a problem that went back to, to um, Greg used to date... Uh, Greg Ridley, bass player. Greg Ridley used to date the lady that became Sandy, Sandy Sargent, who became um, Matt's first wife. She was one of the dancers on Ready, Steady, Go. And there was, you know, something going on there that just didn't quite... And, and I think Mac didn't feel right about deserting his two mates. With Steve had left, if he'd have left too, and, and you know, it was a, it was a very weird time. It, and I don't think it would have worked because I just don't think it would have worked. In theory, yes, but in practice, I don't think... No. But the spawning of the small faces into two supergroups. Oh, my God. Yeah. 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 It, it, well, it, it did turn out good for everybody, didn't it? I mean, it, uh, uh, when it first happened, yeah. but, oh, no. Well, you, you know, you, I said to Steve the night he called me and said, I want to join your band because Peter and I were already working on putting a band together. Oh. You know, months before, oh. months before that famous night when Steve walked off stage at the Alexander Alley Pally. Um, Steve had introduced me to Peter because Peter was looking for a drummer who played like Kenny. So Steve said, I know the very guy. And uh, called me. I went down to meet Peter at Steve's cottage, Beehive Cottage, and then Peter came up literally the next day, I think, to see me play with the band I was in with Tim Rennick in Cambridge. And he offered to drive me back after the gig to the band house and offered me the gig and he said do you want i'd like you to be my drummer i'd love you playing and, and that was going to be the peter frampton band was it or the people yeah that yeah. would have been whatever you know it was there was it was peter's it was still going to be it was actually he was very sweet about it, it was going to be our band you know yes it was peter frampton's band but he treated it and the way he treated me as we were putting a band together bless his heart Unless that was just my youth seeing it that way, but that's the way he was treating it. Uh, Ginger Baker wouldn't have gone that way, I don't think, no. No, 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 no. I think Ginger Baker would have... Uh, anyway. Then, out of nowhere, on New Year's Eve 1968, going into 69, Peter and I both get phone calls within minutes of each other from Steve Marriott saying, hello, mate, I've just quit the small faces. Can I join your band? Peter never says this, but it did happen. Um, this Peter's version is, yes, he says, yes, of course, that'd be great. Would lovely. And that is true. That's what we said. But what we initially said was, no, you can't do that. You can't leave the small faces. Well, you're nuts. And he was made up his mind. He'd had enough. He said, no, I'm done. It's over. And if you knew, Steve, once he made up his mind, there was no change in it. So... Then it was like, with me, what 
the cream, the icing on the cake was, he said, by the way, I've got a bass player wants to come along, Greg Ridley from Spooky Tooth. Now, he was my favourite bass player. He was just... He's fantastic. You two together on Rockin' the Fillmore. <laughs> Mate, yeah, incredible. Absolutely. He helped. You would know. Uh, he helped almost invent that type of bass playing at that time. There wasn't a lot of people right. playing a sort of a, a, an Americanized, you know, Motown-ish. Yeah. Um, duck, um, yeah, fantastically musical. Lots of dusty ends. Really cool. Yeah, I mean, he had a uh, and, and a singer and a singer as well. Right? Well, what a singer! Yeah. What a, and that that was the thing when we had our first rehearsals that hit me. Apart from we immediately hit a groove, a backbeat like I'd never experienced. Just fat, fat backbeat. And but then when they started to sing together. Like, wow, you know, I, I was in heaven. I'd just joined the greatest band in the world. Except so had Steve Stills and Dave Crosby and uh, Graham Nash and uh, um, uh, Ginger Baker, uh, Eric Clapton, Steve Winwood. I mean, there was about five yeah. or six or more um, of those, you know, named Super people. Groups. Super group, super yeah. group. But the thing about the super group thing was, I always say, yeah, we were called a super group, and at the time they said, Steve Marriott, the Small Faces, Peter Frampton, Heard, Greg Ridley, Spooky Tooth, and Jerry Shirley. <laughs> of the as apostolic uh, yeah. intervention. Yeah, for the apostolic the intervention. Apostolic what? <laughs> 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 Yeah, yeah. Of the, of the, of the big, Spanish it, Inquisition. Steve, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know. Steve shared all this. They, they did share the singing around because you sang on one of the Humble Pie tracks as well, didn't you? Yeah, 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 I did. I, embarrassingly so. Yes, I did. Um, I can write songs, not that many, but I can't sing them. I just, when, you know, when your voice goes south, when you get to about 10, 11, 12, whatever. And you go from singing up there to singing down there, um, and I lost the I lost my voice. It never it never developed once it once that part of our anatomy that drops dropped. Once my nuts went south, so so did my voice. I couldn't sing well anymore. And take um, take us back to take us back though to to when you were, those nights at the Fillmore. Um, oh man! And what uh, that tour was like. Uh, we played there prior to the night that we recorded it. We played there, I think, 24 times, 24 shows. We were the go-to band whenever there was a band who fell out for some reason. You know, they couldn't show up. Someone got sick, whatever. We had some of the shows that were all pre-booked. We knew we were going to do. But then we'd be 100 miles away, maybe in, in Philadelphia or somewhere, and we'd get a call, quick, Bill Graham needs a band. Off we go but, and sit in. I think Jeff Botol was one that fell out, so we were there. This happened a lot. So by the time we got to play the night that we did the live album, it was at the end of a 10-week tour, so we were tight as a duck's behind, and... Mm -hmm. You know how that goes, guys. When you've been on the road as that long, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. the longer yeah, yeah. you're out there, the tighter the band gets. Um, but it was perfect because we developed a following at the Fillmore, and uh, it all went on the tape beautifully. Um, we weren't headliners that night, by the way. The night that, that was recorded, oh. we were second on the bill. Lee Michaels was the headliner. Wow, I didn't know that. That's and a lot of people don't. <laughs> and and um, no, because it's not something you you think to do. Is, that's right. Is, um, is do a live album when you're supporting because you know you want your audience. Well, right? that's the thing. They, they were. We apparently sold right, right. seventy percent of the tickets. That that's our bigger following we'd got in the Fillmore. You know, we were to go. We were to go see band at the Fillmore at, by that point. Were well, you doing two shows a night? Yeah. Two shows a night over two nights, so four shows over a, a, each time you appeared there, and like I say, it added up with us to a total of twenty-six shows 
in you know, the amount of, from the very first time we played there opening for Santana till the last time when we recorded the album. And um, we nearly screwed the album up entirely when we mixed it because of our inexperience of mixing live albums. We mixed out all the ambient mics. We treated it like it was a studio album. Uh, right, so all right. the audience and all that beautiful room sound, we, we got, for some unknown reason, we just didn't, you know, inexperience. Our manager came and heard it and said, what have you done? Where's the audience? You ruined it. It's, you know, so we took the tapes to America and had Eddie Kramer mix it at Electric Ladyland. And of course, Eddie had had a lot of experience with uh, recording live. And to be honest, Peter did most of the, you know, it was a sort of a too many cooks thing. So we didn't want the whole band there all the time getting in the way. And Peter would be the main guy that would go and sit with Eddie. And if it wasn't Peter, it would be Steve. And if it wasn't Steve, um, it would be all four of us. So, uh, but to give him credit, Peter was the one that went out of his way to be the representative. But, I, you know, that doesn't mean to say we were never there. I was there a lot. It was just amazing the difference when someone who knew that were doing all that beautiful live ambient sound that was in that that room happened to be the best sounding room in America. Because what was the film more like? Because we hear so much about it. I've never really known what, what yeah, it was. Was it a, a theatre? Was it a ballroom? It was, was a theatre not dissimilar to The Rainbow. Something like that, uh, you know, maybe a little smaller, better sounding. Yeah. Um, but yeah, somewhere like the what was the Astoria that became the Rainbow. What's amazing about about Humble Pie at that period is the homage they play to American black music is, you know, because. You know that we're, we're at that time. You know there were a lot of people getting their heads together in Laurel Canyon, and you know there was there was much more of a rock sound generally, but this was, this was much more, you know, I mean, you, you were playing tracks by Ike and Tina Turner, you know, I, 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 I'm ready and, um, and black coffee and, uh, is later on, obviously, but you know, Ray Charles, hallelujah. I just love her. So, you know, with that fantastic swing that you do on that track, Jerry, but, um, but, uh, you know, Steve's, Steve's respect for black music. And in fact, bringing in the Blackberries as well, which had the singer from, from, um, uh, uh, I can Tina Turner's band, you know, and incorporating them. I remember, guy, you must have seen Black Coffee on the Old Grey Whistle Test. Yeah, the Old Grey Whistle Test, where it's a legendary. Which, you, which we right, can't yeah. see you in, Jerry. You're as, lost as, behind, yeah, everybody. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, all you see is a little bit of fire, and that's it. It's such a tiny room, that the original room, um, that then we, did, we recorded two tracks. We recorded um, Black Coffee, and we recorded. Um, a version Twisted Shout with Vanetta Fields, the Iket, doing the lead vocal. And on that, you can see me just about. But on Black Coffee, one of the best live things we did on TV, you can't see me at all, which is a perfect sort of um, drummer thing to happen. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, so, yeah. Welcome to my world, mate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know. The only time I ever get a camera is during the guitar yeah. solo. <laughs> Drums and bass. Going back, going, Drums back to my, going back to my point, you know, yeah. it, you were embracing uh, black music yeah. quite heavily. And I, uh, and, with it, with, and that was being, Americans got that. I mean, that was coming from Steve, I guess, wasn't it? You know, growing up as mods, listening to Tamla Motown. Well, we all four of us came from backgrounds that were steeped in the same influences. That was the main thing, that we all loved Booker T and the MGs. We all loved Tamla Motown. We all loved Ray Charles live in his famous 1959 live album recorded in Atlanta on one mic, I might add, and it sounds beautiful. Um, we all loved Aretha. We all loved... All those, th you know, Otis, Otis Blue, all that great Stax Motown stuff before Humble Pie. That's what we had in common. Was, And then when the band came out with their take on 
being in a soulful tight band of their own, that affected us a lot. And then if you put it all in the mixer and out comes this British version of American soul and R and B and blues. And um it it all I suppose culminated in at its best on the on the Fillmore album, certainly. There's another live album that we did as a King Biscuit Flower Hour um, broadcast uh, the year later with the Blackberries that was released to a lesser degree but is still at, us at our best. Is It's like the Fillmore is us at our best with Peter and this one at the, uh, the Winterland is us at our best with Clem Clemson on guitar and the Blackberries singing with us. Because don't forget, the Blackberries also had a, a Raylette in them. Clyde King, may she rest in peace, was one of them. Oh. So we had a Raylette, an Iket, and Billy Barnum, who was their friend, who was also a great singer. And, I mean, From the you know, again, <laughs> and the th- all through this, I'm, I'm 19 years old at the Fillmore. Oh, I'm 20, 21 years old at the, at the, at the Winterland. And there's all these people around me who gave me such encouragement, treated me as an equal, didn't kind of put me down or make me feel like, well, you're just a kid or anything like that. Um, and I owe them a great deal because of that. Jerry, on the I, Humble Pie album, the third yeah. studio album you made, the, the, the track I'm Ready on that, with you begin, your yeah. drumming is phenomenal. Well, thank um, you. <laughs> Oh, it always amazes me that people like what I did. <laughs> wow. Well, you were very good. That's why, Jerry. But because um, you you have the distinction of aren't, aren't you you're the one person who who was who was in every incarnation of humble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Nick Mason. Yeah, yeah. I suppose. Yeah, I was, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I've met Nick so many times, but I've never really got to know him. You know, uh, uh, no no reason why not. I just David. David was always my mate. Um, and well, you uh, took his job on that Sid album, didn't you? That's why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. I don't, I don't think so. I don't, I don't... No, no, no. Well, I still remember we were, have, we were having, having a great night with you in Cleveland back in That's 94. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, That's, t- yeah. You, you, you just, yes, we did. Really, we? I, you, you, did, you guys yeah. got me up on the stage on Soundcheck, didn't you? Do you remember that? That's right. Yes. And, 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 That's right. To surprise David. Because it, I was working for the radio station in uh, in, right, in Cleveland yeah. at the time. You're a DJ. At That's the time. right. Yeah. And, and and the main, the biggest station in town, were really jealous that I was getting all these scoops, like going to the McCartney show and getting an interview with Paul, uh, because of my friend John Hamill, um, who worked for Paul, and then coming to interview Dave, David, um, and then there. The other station are all in the stadium while you're sound checking, watching what's going on, and you guys bring me up on stage without David seeing what was happening and said, I didn't know you were going to do it. And you said, hey, come on, get up on, on the other drummer's kit. <laughs> and I'm suddenly sitting there on this drum That's... kit I've never played before. It was bigger than me, you know, but um, and then Dave, oh, yeah, yeah. Dave could tell the, the groove had changed a little bit. You know, maybe he thought, that sounds familiar, I don't know. But then he turned around and saw me, <laughs> big smile on his face. <laughs> oh, dear. Jerry, you have a great book out. Do you want to just plug it for a second? Um, what, the, 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 the book's called... What a title, I love the title. The Best Seat in the House. <laughs> That's a great title. Well, it, that came out by accident. The, the title happened by accident because the title I was originally going to use was I used to be a rock star, but I'm all right now. And they said, <laughs> you know, they said, yes, but no. <laughs> because it was, they want, you know, and I said, well, how about, I don't know, the best seat in the house? Because it was, it was by far the best seat in the house. There's a number of books with that title, but I think it's the only one about music. By drummer. Yeah, yeah, which uh, yeah. thankfully I managed to snag it, uh, snag it before before any other drummer, I guess. But um, I think I'm proud of that book just because 
I, it, it started because my hips went south and I couldn't play. And so all I could do was sit and write. I had never used a typewriter or a computer before. This is back in 2008, nine, around there. I, I was completely unconnected to the computer world or typing at all. And I sat there for a couple of years on and off and wrote 600 pages. And, you know, just kept writing and writing and writing. And, of course, that had to be chopped down to a sellable amount. And um, it did quite well, considering. I mean, it's just little me. It's not Ginger Baker. <laughs> Uh, great stories, though. I mean, you know, it, you've you've yeah. worked with two. I mean, sadly, no longer with us. Two of the great, great people in this business, Sid and, and Stevie Marriott. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there's also some John Entwistle's yeah, album. That's right. Yeah, I did that <laughs> when I was his first solo really? album. Really? Yeah. I, yeah. Say, I was 18 when I did that. Yeah. And oh, wow. Um, he, he, he's a monster to play with. But actually, funny enough, I mean, you must have loved Keith anyway, so it must have been yeah. a great honour for you. Well, yeah, well, Keith and I had become mates anyway because, again, we our band used to open up for the Who a lot. And Keith was, you know, everybody's friend. He was one of those guys that mm -hmm. once you, you met him for five minutes, you'd known him for two minutes, he was your best mate. And he was always very kind to me. And on those sessions, my kit, had been left in America because we were on a break and it didn't pay to bring all the kit, all the equipment home to only then turn around and take it back again. It was easier to leave it in America, go home for a break. So I didn't have a kit. I had to go to Drum City to hire a kit. Now, back in the day, Drum City were a bunch of snobs to us lesser known drummers. Keith knew this because he went through it before he was well known. So I get there the day of the beginning of the, the, the uh, sessions, and the one thing I asked for, uh, I, well, I wanted it to be a love with kit, but I said, if, as long as it's got a Speed King pedal, that's all I ask. This is me talking to Drum City, and of course, they send it, and there's no Speed King pedal. So Keith comes on the first day to wish everybody well, and help us start opening the bar, which was on the top of the grand piano. The <laughs> grand piano was a bar, the entire top of it. He's, he could see I was a little bit down. He, he said, what's the matter? I said, well, it's Drum City. They've sent this kit over there with this horrible, God knows what pedal. And all I asked him, he got on the phone and he ripped into them. And within 10 minutes, there was a brand new speaking drum pedal delivered to Trident Studios by Drum City. Thank you, Keith Moon. And uh, it was, yeah, those those sessions, they, they were all done in five days, I think. And we completed the whole album, the backtracks in five days, and it was mixed. And my mother was passing away as we were doing it. It was a very heavy oh. time for me. And we finished the tracks on a Friday night and we had to go back on Monday just to check a few things and this and that. I went to visit her at Harlow Hospital on Saturday. And as I'm walking into the hospital, my auntie, her sister, comes running out of her room, screaming, crying. And of course, I realized she, um, you know, again, I'm 17, 18 years old. And I walked, got to walk into the room to see her draw her last breath. And it was just unbelievably you know you can only imagine what that was like i had to go back on the monday to the studio and my the agreement was that i was going to get paid a uh, handsome 150 pounds for the sessions and john was going to pay himself and the guitar player 300 he gives me a check. john it was to place himself for his own yeah. album yeah, yeah, because he was financing it, and oh, I see. you know that's how it went. So anyway, he gives me an envelope for my check. I open it up, and it's not 150. It's the same as him. It's 300. And all he said, oh. he said, oh. I thought this might help given the circumstances. Oh, 
Because, yeah, that's very sweet. Cause it's, especially because it's a very macabre album to be working on. At that well, yeah. Time. Because, of course, with John, there's a lot of very dark. And it was the engineer was a young Roy Thomas that's Baker, right. yeah. I believe, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't mean to lower the tone there. I'll just, but the truth is, that, you know, <laughs> it, that's what happened. You know? Jerry, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, it's been great. I mean, really amazing insights, touchstones into like such incredible moments with the Floyd and Speakeasy and uh, with, with obviously with Humble Pie and I think we, we passed through Mick Jagger and Jimi Hendrix as well, didn't we? Yeah, I think we got in, there. in passing, yeah. Can I just tell you one quick yeah. thing about the uh, um, going into Abbey Road years later? But, oh, yes. Yeah, um, I was, you know those rock and roll camp things they do where they get people oh, yeah, together? Yeah. Well, I was sitting in on one of those helping out Mick Ralphs because he could only do a couple of days and he was booked for four. So I sat in for Mick, and it involved going to Abbey Road with the band that you'd been given to try and mentor. And as I'm walking in, this is after Rick and Sid have both passed away. It was about so it was about 2008, 2009. And on the one pillar of the two pillars in the gateway to Abbey Road, there was graffiti, yeah. and on the one side it said. We love you, Rick Wright. May you rest in peace. And on the other one, we love you, Sid Barrett. May you rest in peace. And as as I'm walking in, I realise, wait a minute, 46 or whatever it was years before, I'd been walking in there to play with these two guys and David. Yeah. You know, it was just such a beautiful moment. It, it's yeah. Poignant, I think, is what the word would be. Wow. I'm very lucky. Wow, what a very, very lucky man to have had those experiences. Well, you've certainly had the experiences, Jay. There's no question of that. And, you, you know, and you deserve to, mate. You're a brilliant driver. Well, thank you so much. I mean, it's an honour to have met you. And, uh, you know, yeah. you've, you've been in my life for many years, many decades, Jerry. Well, I, We still I, play I, those tracks. We still play that those albums. I'm thrilled to know that, that you guys, your generation, were listening to us, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. because there's quite a difference between the sound of Spandau Ballet and the sound of Bumble Pie. And yeah, but do you know what? It's funny because all of us were into that album uh, in that band. And when we toured in the eighties, we were always playing that John, John Keeble, our drummer, especially loved it, you know, oh, wow. and, uh, that my, and my brother and me, I mean, it was, it was Steve Norman. It's a, it was a big record in our, in a, I mean, you know, I think it's it's one of the greatest live albums ever made, isn't it? Well, that, thank you. And you guys, but you did, you, you, it seemed to me like you, you guys became, you took where the mods were and took it to another level, you know, um, and, and, and and some beautiful, and you've written some, you've written some seriously good songs there, my son. <laughs> oh, thanks, Jerry. Listen, if we're in Cornwall, we should meet up. Yeah, absolutely. Anytime, anytime, you're welcome. Well, that was our sort of target rock on tours era, wasn't it, really? It kind of was, wasn't it? Yeah. Or well, no, we. I I would say we have two target areas, which is that exactly that him and all the rooms he was in, and the eighties. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's the, it's the speakeasy or it's the, it's blitz the speakeasy or the rum blitz. rubber. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Lime but, light. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know, I mean, the thing is about Jerry. He's such a he's a humble man, literally as well. But and he, uh, and he likes he hasn't eaten all the pies though. <laughs> yes, but it was just. Those, that moment of that kid through the kid's eyes of, of being there with Ginger Baker, of being there when Jimmy and Mick and, and Charlie and all these names that, that are historic legends to us, you know. Um, it's the joy of doing this program. It's of talking to these people. Absolutely. Who, and getting their stories down on tape, as it were. Yeah, exactly. Uh, to be preserved was... for future generations. Yes. Um, Ian our producer for today, because Ben's away, has apparently got a Sid story. That's right. Ian, Ian are you Ian's, there? Ian's going to tell us all about it. OK, guys. Well, my old boss, Nick Baraklov, who got me into this business of music and radio and stuff, his sister Alison went to school with Sid in Cambridge. And on the very last day of school, Sid gave her his marbles. And also, apparently... Sid once kissed a girl at school, does this snog, and the whole playground turned out to watch it. There was an audience surrounding this couple having a schoolyard kiss. So Sid was a star at 11 Even, or something like wow. that. 
Well, so. there it is. You heard. That's another rock on tour scoop. Yes. How Sid lost his marbles or gave them away. Gave, or, he gave them away. Willingly. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. Now go Thank away. <laughs> There's something we have to say, isn't there, Guy? Uh, I think, well, yes, of course. We ha do now um, offer, uh, we've launched Rock Hunters Extra, which you can sign up for. Uh, and then you'll get extra bonus episodes, you know, including some of the specials we've done, like on Andy Rourke and David Crosby. And you get extra video content. Who have we got on video, Gary? Uh, we've got Stuart Copeland out there. We've got Paul Simonon. There's some stuff from the, the or there will be uh, some stuff from the Screen on the Green special that we did, our first live show. Um, and, and we'll keep doing that. So we'll also, you can get to ask questions and you can uh, you can also get to hear about live events that are up and coming um, before anyone else. Exactly. So sign up today. Yes. Um, but well, that's it, isn't it, for this show? That's it for this show. Um, I, yeah, go, it was a I'm great go, one. He's a lovely, he loves the chat. He's a sweet man, isn't he? Sweet man. I'm going to go off and play more Humble Pie and uh, rock in the film one. Eat it. And I'm not <laughs> going to eat the album. I'm not going to eat Humble Pie. No, no. Well, although perhaps one of these days. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it's good night from me. Good night from them. Rock on Tours is produced by Gimme Sugar Productions. A Warner Music Group UK.